Hey, everybody, this is Pete, a Turner executive producer and host of your Break It Down show. We've had Colonel John McKay on several times. If you haven't listened to his background episodes, let me do you a favor. Go listen to his stuff. You're not going to believe how this guy grew up and what he's experienced. Now, this falls into this week of shows that we're doing that are designed for the folks that are going to be attending the Military Advisor Training Academy and are going to work in SFABs, the Security Forces Advisor Brigades. These are people that are going to go abroad from the military to other militaries to other governmental organizations, and they're going to try to help build capacity, whether it's in direct boots on the ground combat type skills, or if it's how to run supply or logistics or partner in some way that helps our partners in fill in the blank country out. Maybe they're in Jordan, maybe they're in Burma, maybe they're in Georgia, their Georgia, not ours. Wherever they go, they need these advisor skills. Well, there's nobody, 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 nobody that I know that has more experience in more places over across more generations of time than Colonel John McKay. John is an absolute master of international diplomacy. Now, his home language is Spanish, but he also speaks Quechua, and he understands the nuance of culture no matter where he goes, anytime, any place, anywhere. John can integrate himself and work within his partner's mindset and mission to accomplish his own mission, and that's what makes him a master advisor, and that's why you are listening to what he has to say. Again, go check out his other episodes. We talk about this topic a lot, but there's very very, very, very good stuff in here, especially when he talks about the key attributes of what it is to be a good advisor and where you need to put your priorities. This is a fantastic episode. You will get a lot out of it. If you love what we do, this is what we do. We bring ground truth to things. We illustrate life. Right now, we're illustrating how to partner, whether you're in the military or you're traveling or you're working in a country situation that you're not familiar with, or even within your own company, department to department, all of these advising skills, all of these cultural skills, these are useful to you all. So I hope you can appreciate that. This is not only good for our advisors, but it's also good for you in the professional civilian world. Uh, here's how you support the show. Go to breakitdownshow.com, subscribe. That's the best way. If you're on Apple or iTunes and you're listening to the show there, subscribe, rate, tell your friends about it. That's how you help us grow the show and make it something bigger. Recommending the show to someone, super, super valuable. Thank you so much when you do that. If you're new to the show, hey, we don't just talk military stuff around here. We have so many musical producers coming up. We're going to have more filmmakers coming in. We've got a lot of different people creating a lot of content. I defy you to find a show that has more people producing content to a single, simple show. You cannot find it. I purposely built this thing to be broad so that you can always find a topic that you're interested in. All right, listen, here comes the incredible mind of John McKay. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan This is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morata. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. <laughs> This is Colonel John McKay, and we're listening to the Break It Down Show. So I'm having Colonel John McKay come on the show because he's got an amazing background and experience as a Marine working overseas. He's truly an internationalist. Uh, He understands the world at a level that many of us don't. And these shows are specifically designed for SFAB warriors who are trying to figure out how to advise, assist, and uh, guide partnered nations and partners specifically to a to a place of more capacity. So we're creating these. There's, there's ultimately going to be about five of these episodes that are going to be designed for that. So there's a lot to pull from this, but this is a very specific project talking to warriors who are going to interact and and liaison and guide other people. So, John, if you could give us some background on on why you'd be qualified to talk about partnering with uh, foreign nationals. be happy to do that, Pete, and look forward to doing so. Uh, I was reared in Latin America. By the age six, I was bilingual Spanish. Uh, In fact, spoke and felt more comfortable speaking Spanish than I did English. I also had... um, as a blessing, uh, my father's position with the corporation that he was working for allowed him to uh, uh, put me out on the corporation's uh, very, very extensive Hacienda system at the age of nine, where I, during the summer and Christmas vacations, worked for room and board. I was the only American, I was the only English speaker and I was exposed to and was able to pick up, certainly not 
fluently, but pick up Quechua, uh, the Indian language. From Latin America, uh, where I was down, I was there until I was 15 years old. Uh, I came back, and after I graduated in high school, 1962, joined uh, joined the enlisted in the Marine Corps. I got a uh, second half appointment to the Naval Academy, and uh, graduated in '68. While at the Naval Academy, I was picked up as an Olmsted Scholar candidate that would not be evaluated until three years after graduation selection based on uh, professional performance in uniform. Uh, I debarked almost immediately within seven months for Vietnam. Um, I was uh, I was wounded and medevaced and put back together in a hospital, which was which was a lengthy stay. Uh, shortly after release from hospital, I was selected as an Olmsted scholar, studied two years in Spain, and was completely immersed in, in, in Spain, Spanish culture, which the Olmsted Foundation insisted at that time, and I abided by. After I got out, uh, finished that, uh, and this is on topic, I'm not going to talk about my career, uh, as a very junior major, I was selected as the first official naval attache to the Republic of El Salvador, the very first. And as the audience and the officers and men that are listening will recall, El Salvador was embroiled in a very, very nasty uh, civil war guerrilla insurgency. While in El Salvador, where I extended twice, it was an unaccompanied tour. I extended down there twice. Uh, I'm not going to talk about anything there other than the fact uh, that the U.S. ambassador, who just recently died, Dean Hinton, accused me, uh, in a positive sense, of having gone completely native. Um, and I ask you to keep that in mind, because yeah. I, think it's, I think it's to the point. In fact, the ambassador had to remind me that it was appropriate that I, as a U.S. naval attaché, show up at the 4th of July celebration at the embassy. And I'll leave it at that. <laughs> the subsequent assignments was battalion commander, JTF commander. While JTF commander, although this is not an advisory role, one of my collateral, and I consider one of the more pleasant and certainly important duties, was direct no negotiation with the Cuban authorities at Guantanamo Bay, uh, Cuba. My counterpart was a uh, Cuban Armed Forces one-star general, and we made tremendous progress, and at least within the U.S. military, and I can only surmise within the communist Cuban military, uh, there was a desire to move forward. Political forces decided otherwise. After Cuba, uh, I uh, retired from the Marine Corps in the late uh, 90s and uh, got a job with a national intelligence agency and was dispatched almost immediately to train Palestinian uh, security forces. That training uh, was authorized and to a certain degree encouraged under the 1973 Oslo Accords. Uh, this was a part of the world that uh, my one big drawback, and we can come back to this as Pete decides, my one big drawback working with the Palestinians was I do not speak Arabic. And, and I think that is a major, major drawback. Uh, on the positive side, I had a Bedouin, young Bedouin kid, who was superb, and uh, we we hit it off. I mean, we uh, I was breaking policy. I would stay in Gaza um, with him, uh, usually sleeping on the floor. We'd stay in the West Bank. Uh, when we came to either Jerusalem or Tel Aviv, I always made sure he bunked with me. Uh, I had that leeway. And Khalil was his name, and I... I, I uh, do not speak Arabic. Khalil was very, very good. The point being, my work was 
exclusively, almost exclusively with the Palestinian security forces in Gaza, the West Bank. Uh, I had very little action, interaction with the Israelis, although they certainly knew what I was doing. I had just a little bit more interaction with the American authorities, i.e. through the U.S. Embassy that at that time was in Tel Aviv. I would go and submit my reports, get my operational funds, and, and, and that was about it. Otherwise, I was in the field, and, and uh, I was... I think I'm being very conservative here. I, I was at least 85 to 90 percent of the time with with Arab forces, with the Palestinian forces. And though I didn't speak the language, again we'll come back to that. I have since worked in West Africa. That was not an advisory role. That was strictly commercial U.S. commercial interest, working for a private U.S. company that had a major contract. I was chosen because the country I worked in, Equatorial Guinea, is the only sub-Saharan country in Africa where Spanish is spoken. I would not, and I would encourage the audience not to, don't divorce civilian experience working with native uh, indigenous personnel from what you're looking at to do in the military. A lot of lessons to learn. And they're all positive lessons that you can take or discard as you see fit. But don't say, I was a civilian job, that doesn't count. Not true. You're still dealing in native language, dealing with natives. And you may not be looking at a military objective, but you do have a goal to accomplish. And I would offer that that type of interaction uh, is complementary. To what you're looking at in the military. Since then, I, I got picked up. I was in a, in a special status with uh, the Drug Enforcement Agency. Again, I was brought on board because of my Spanish. Up until 2010, I was working Mexico for obvious reasons. I was in Mexico. Again, I would say in an advisory role, short term, very short term, in the sense that it was six weeks. Uh, I, I had uh, I was sent down to the Mexican Federal Police Academy in San Luis Potosi in Guerrero uh, State in Mexico. And uh, my, my remit was to set up and teach a course in human rights to the young uh, police cadets uh, that were to graduate and go into the federal uh, police force. Not, the, not rural police force, not municipal police force, but the national uh, federal police force as they say in spanish los federales and there was very intense in, in, interaction both with the students uh, with the authorities at the at the uh, mexican police academy uh, which needless to say were all officers yeah. that experience i think stood me in very good stead again specifically military no it's it's police uh, but i i would offer that that type of uh, exposure uh, is right up what the audience is thinking, considering, uh, you know, we're not going into a Franco-Prussian war situation where everybody lines up and charges each other. We're in a very murky situation and where the police authority stops, where the military authority starts is, is, is a very, very, blurry, blurry line. And then you go the other way, where does police authority start and stop, and where does the civil authority start? Again, a very, very blurry line. And it's not a line that you can say, oh, okay, well, today I'm going to be in this box, and I'm going to be playing my role as a military advisor. Right. Not true. Okay. Not true. Uh you're going to go to work and say, well, I'm going to be working with the department, the national, local Department of Justice. And two hours later, you're down at the police station interrogating a, a suspect. Or you're down at the police station advising how they should plan a counter drug raid, how they should plan a, an operation to take out a specific individual. 
very, very, very murky. And 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 I, the only thing I can say is keep yourself open-minded, flexible, and able to react as circumstances dictate. Because it's going to be very, very rare that you're going to get up in the morning and say, well, I'll go down and have a cup of coffee, and then I'm going to interrogate Jose. Or I'm going to go down and have a cup of coffee, and the colonel and I are going to get together, and we're going to decide how we're going to do uh, special operations op. Uh, op. Uh, it, it's, it, I, it's not going to work out that way. Okay. And uh, if, if you can keep that in mind, I think it would stand you in tremendous stead. I wanted to ask you about what it takes to do these things, to partner, to liaise, to advise someone from a foreign country well. What, what are the day-to-day things? Because look, the, the reality is this, Colonel, the, the military doesn't have a handbook on this. They say build rapport. Well, where's the FM? Uh, you know, develop trust. Well, you know, <laughs> where again, where's the FM? Where's the course? If these right. things are all done. They aren't done institutionally. They're done individually. And it's hard to repeat your lessons without having some kind of program to go through. So, uh, and, and just to further illustrate this, if you had a bunch of young Marines who weren't hitting center mass on a target from the prone position or from the kneeling position, that you can point to your gunny and say, fix that. And he's got a list of steps that he can take to specifically break that action down until that Marine is now firing center mass repeatedly on a target 500 meters away from a variety of positions. That is not the case in partnering. So help us understand some of these things that you're like, this is the dime washer drill of the, you know, uh, of the partner world. Um, As, as, uh, Pete and I have discussed in the past, uh, I think one of the keys, uh, really the golden key, if at all you could get it, and I think it should definitely be included in the manual, um, is um, language fluency. Uh, and and I, I fully understand and appreciate the fact uh, that for the United States, that is not a fully embraced uh, idea. There's 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 a certain hesitancy on the part of I would say mostly civilian authorities, but there's a certain hesitancy to encourage a universal foreign language exposure for the population, and I don't think it's that much for the military, except for institutions like DLI. But I I'm, I'm getting off track here. The language I think is 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 critical. Can you do the job without it? Yes, you can. Most of the time you have to. But I, I think that's that's number one. Okay. Number two, um, and and language helps out immensely here, but nevertheless you can you can do something. Forearm yourself with as in depth as possible knowledge of the culture. People uh, Pete and I have, have spoken at certain cultures, Middle East, um, even Latin America, believe it or not, there are certain do's and don'ts. Make yourself aware of those. Unfortunately, Americans tend to go there and somebody pulls a faux pas. It's faux, faux pas. Uh, there's, there's sort of, uh, you know, a self-conscious giggle and laugh it off type thing. Uh, your host nation may not look at it that way. And but how, do, how does one do that? How does one determine the culture? I mean, the military has, quote unquote, cultural training. But let's be honest, it's not it's not what you no. do. It's not what I do. No. I, I, you know, no. I don't no. fear no. eating left handed in front of an Islamic guy. You know, I, I um, right. I know I can I know I'm not supposed to make the OK symbol in parts of the former Yugoslavia because it's, you know, might right. indicate right. Serbian victory. But th- those are minor things. How does one learn a culture in advance without being there? Or how does one become culturally intelligent so that they can go to any place with little or no prep and start to become, you know, salt? Culturally adept. Oh, that you know, see that that is uh, it, it's an absolute uh, critical, acute question that deserves the best answer. And I, I just I fear I can't give it. Uh, 
Okay. I, I, I think there's, um, uh, there's so much reading you can do. There's so many videos you can, there's so many audios you can listen to, uh, all helpful. Absolutely. Uh, I, I would say the next step up, um, with or without language knowledge is, uh, get the, get the officer, get the, get the, uh, sergeant first class, uh, get the sergeant major in country and, 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 uh, uh, I would offer that the service, be it Army, Navy, Marine Corps, DOD, that whatever country you're looking at, that they have some kind of, um, I don't want to use the word regimented, but some type of scheduled, structured program for familiarization of new people coming in. And I would assume when we're talking about the SF community, special ops community, uh, most of these guys are volunteers. Most of these guys have gone through some kind of screening process. Uh, you, you, you would go back as far as the screening and selection process. Does this person have the adaptability? Uh, does he have any, uh, you know, prejudices that would be contradictory to what we in the SF special ops or whatever community are aiming to do and aiming to use him in? Uh, it's a screening process. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm getting away from Pete's question. How do you introduce him to the culture? How do you inoculate him with a sense of culture? Okay, well, let's fast forward and, and we get the individual in country. I, I think short of what I just mentioned, books, videos, audios, uh, presentations, traveling road shows, whatever you want to do, uh, the, the, the next step is to get in country and have the person be exposed to the maximum degree possible. And unfortunately, and I'm editorializing here, Americans have a terrible, terrible time breaking away from other Americans. And, and, and that's not necessarily good. There are certainly circumstances, I when somebody's trying to kill you, but it's really great to have a bunch of Americans around you. If you're trying to influence somebody else, three guys walking in on a Palestinian colonel that are all Americans and they may not have shaved and they may not be uniformed, but it's, it's imposing. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, that colonel is made aware of that. Whereas a one-on-one -on -one situation where you're able to establish a rapport and that's my next point, become culturally aware, be able Hopefully the services are, again, through the screening process, are able to identify people that are comfortable in establishing a rapport with a foreign counterpart. And, and I don't mean rapport in the sense you go down and have a few hooks and a couple of uh, chuckles. I'm talking about being able to sit down, have a mutual respect, be able to establish grow and hopefully expand a bond of confidence and a bond of respect mm. mutual you don't or you should not go in i am an american captain and uh, you are ex-country colonel you have to listen to me because i know more and as pete and i have described on a much much bigger or macro scale um, that attitude is has not served us well in the recent past when i'm overseas a lot of times i'm evaluating how we do things you know because we don't have this training and and if we're again if we're firing the rifle in such a way that it's hitting our partner in a bad way or missing them you know my job is to illustrate that for the command so they can start to try to fix that so one of my instant responses is if I hear someone say, but my commander wants this, I identify that person as being a no-go at this station. And I go, okay, <laughs> how do we get this person to be oriented? And of all of the things I learned, uh, I had an Afghan elder. He's the senior guy. He is the government. And he says, there's only room for one sword in the scabbard. And I present that to the infantry battalion commander who happens to be a, a, a foreign service officer, an FSO, 
And he goes, got it. He's the boss. We're going to do everything that he wants to do. That's how we're going to provision him. And we're going to do as little as possible because he needs to be able to do this himself. Now what the boss wants is something totally different. So how do we yeah. get away from that imposition of will from our hire on a, on a partner? Like you can't serve these two masters. Um, you're unfair, Pete. That's a loaded <laughs> question. Uh, seriously, uh, again, and, and the military doesn't like to hear this, and I speak from personal knowledge uh, because I'm not current military, and you know, I, I retired almost 20 years ago. Right. Uh, it was a different military then. I was fortunate. I felt that I was fortunate being in the Marine Corps and serving for who I served. To get to the Pete's question, you, I would, I would offer that the individuals, enlisted or officers that you're sending uh, in country, regardless of where it is in the world are individuals of a caliber and quality that one of their characteristics is the ability to work, operate, and execute independently or semi-independently. And allow me to suggest, let's extrapolate that into intellect. And somebody comes down, lack of knowledge, perhaps no fault of his own, Bias, prejudice, name it. Right. But, hey, Captain, first sergeant, hey, sergeant major, do this. This is the way we're going to do it. I would say you, as the individual operator, the individual liaison, you are of the sort that you have a smart enough brain, and you can say, I can get that result by doing it this way. Mm. And... I think short of fixed bayonets go over the top. In the world we're talking about today, it's more and more. It is what Pete just described. Somebody telling you, go get this, go get this done with your foreign counterpart. I think the onus becomes upon you, the operator, to not only say, this is my mission, but this is the way I'm going to accomplish it, based on my cultural awareness, knowledge, rapport, and ability to work with my counterpart. I don't know if that answers the no, question. Yeah, or yeah. well, there's, it seems like folks who are going to do this kind of work need to have some ability to... Uh, you know, the mission command concept, you know, like here is the intent yeah, of this mission, yeah. um, which requires commanders to to allow the mission, you know, <laughs> allow the person to use mission command, of course, which takes some uh, courage when you don't have someone you could put your hands on. They're 50 miles away or whatever, and, and they're trying to get through it. But these these tools that that person sits with, one of them is a sense for it. And uh, I've used this example before, but I'm going to use it again. Um, I was doing some work with, with the Army, and we went eh, you know, later in the evening than we normally went, and all of the Iraqi Army guys are around the TV because it was Arab Cup time, and they were all watching football. And this lieutenant, God bless him, was there to get his damn mission done, you know? <laughs> and I kind of smacked him, and I'm like, these guys are watching soccer. Why don't we watch soccer for a while? And... You know, yeah, those moments yeah. where, you know, your initial mission is OBE, you know, overcome by events for the audience. Uh, your your job today is to watch soccer and be fascinated by it and, and let these guys. T it's like walking into the Super Bowl and saying, hey, never mind those. Is it the Chiefs? Never mind that. Let's go talk about personnel issues. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> or as something you and I have both talked about Pete mm. and I think fully agree with the attitude particularly with Latins and with Middle Eastern Arab nations the business of going in in the bull in the China shop American attitude I'm going to get the job done and you go in and say 
I need this, this, and this. Yeah. You talked earlier about what should we be aware of. Well, if you're in the Latin or if you're in the Middle Eastern world, a absolute requirement if you want to get anything done is you go in and you talk about nothing for about mm-hmm. 20 minutes. How's the kids? How's the dog? Is the wife pregnant again? Did she house the baby? Uh, how's the nana? And uh, how's the new cook working out? Now, that doesn't have a damn thing to do with why you're there. But excuse the profanity, you damn well better do it if you're going to get results. And that isn't meant to be, you know, we always have to qualify these things, right? Like, I have now spent 20 minutes engaging with rapport, no. building conversation. <laughs> <Please>. <laughs> Please. Absolutely. Pete is 100% right. You are not running a clock. Right. You're there to get a mission done and do it and do it appropriately in order to get that mission done. There's sort of a game that I would play, John. I don't know if you ever played it, but because I knew I was I was triggered to go and do my job and ask my questions, I would purposely wait as long as I could. I would ask another question about culture, about family, about the area, you know, which is all in effect doing my job. But I wouldn't ask any business until my partner is like, can we get down to work? Uh, that's, you're, again, uh, Pete is extremely perceptive and obviously quite experienced. Uh, when I was in uh, uh, the Middle East, when I was working with the Palestinians, I had a particular individual. Uh, believe it or not, he'd been uh, educated at Oxford. Uh, Palestinian, actually Bedouin, and uh, he was he was always the perfect host. But he had he had some incredible things that were most helpful to me. And I did not mark time on my calendar. I put down Yasser. Right. Now uh, I could go in, and we could have one sweet. Hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. Right. Uh, I could go in and we could have one sweet, gooey sweet tea. Or we could have five. And what Pete has just said is the rule that I went by. As long as Yasser was saying, would you like another cup of tea? You don't say, hell no, we got to get to business. I mean, oh, that would be delicious. Thank you. <laughs> and then he would set his little cup down and said, is there some way I can help you perhaps? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think that would have happened if I'd bust into his office and say, hey, yes, sir, a uh, couple things here. Can you get them for me right away? And he would have been very nice, almost cherubic smile and say, well, of course, John. And I would never hear anything from him. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So these lessons, these things also are, so, okay, we have to have a a linear timeline in our head of the fact that there's been units before us that have likely been there, um, or that you are the last partner this person's ever going to have, at least in in this iteration of of the the military movement, right? Like, so we're going to close down Iraq and we're going to pull back. If you don't talk, if you don't think about the past partners, you're doing yourself a disservice. I'm going to give you a negative example. We had a general who worked in the area outside in the Baghdad province, and he was coming to our camp, a.k.a. his camp. (laughs) This is an Iraqi general going to an American colonel's camp. Um, You know, we're allowed to stay there, you know, and we don't often take that view. And so the guards at the American camp sweated that general for hours outside the camp. Really? Could, yeah. They wouldn't let him in. There was problems. There was traffic. Meanwhile, the the next commander in doesn't know this story. 
And and I tell him this story right after, and this is this is the the juxtaposition of this. We are all lined up, M wraps everywhere, and the colonel is inside the camp trying to get out. And again, pardon my my swearing, but this is the quote. He gets on the radio and says, "Everybody, get the fuck out of my way," <laughs> because it was a okay. it was it was a mess. And so, guess what? Everybody did. Everybody got the fuck out of his way, and he left. And I said, "Let me tell you a story about the last commander that was here." And that yeah. general was angry for many colonels in a row about this. This, you know, you would never do that to any general an american camp you know like an american general absolutely not but we had done it to this iraqi one and he held that grudge and he knew that myself and the interpreter that had been there for several commanders as well he knew that we knew about it and just when you think about that rock that's in your ruck that you have no idea about yeah absolutely uh, it it changes and spending time doing that, understanding what, you know, how did it was, how was it with the last ones? What went well, what didn't go well? Those kind of questions are these rapport building questions where you actually act like you give a down, you know, about, about the person that you're with. And I don't want to say you give up all of your personal information, but being genuine with your answers about your people. I've always found John to be a much better tactic than to say, hi, my name is Drake. I have a daughter. She's 10 years old and have all that stuff be false. It, uh, people are too savvy for that, especially in places that are conflict ridden. Uh, I, again, I, well, it's not like Pete and I haven't talked before, but, uh, but Pete's <laughs> absolutely, absolutely correct. I mean, there's two elements here. You, you ask about what, what are you looking for in somebody you want to send to do liaison work, to interpreter work, uh, working with, uh, Foreign counterparts and developing an intelligent plan, etc. What, what do you want? Well, you certainly would like to have an ideal world language. Uh, you would also like to have, hopefully, that he's from a family from that region or from that particular country. Uh, these are all idealized goals that you're barely, if ever, going to be able to reach. But what Pete has just said, that if the individual and, and this, I, I, I'm convinced it can be taught that the individual that is going in and doing all those things I just checked off has uh, the element of sincerity and genuineness, has the ability to empathize with whoever his counterpart is, along with understanding that you don't go in and say, Habib. I need this right now. Uh-huh. Uh, I, I, I peach right on. I mean, the, and we, we can all think of it. it. You don't have to be in uniform to walk around, be it a civilian office, a major department store, and uh, there's a little ruckus, there's a little uh, hubbub going on, and you can you can spot the phony. Well, let me tell you, you go overseas. If you're a pony, you stick out like a store thumb, and you become your own worst enemy, and by extension, the country's own worst enemy. Can you wrap your hands around any of the other just universal values or lenses or perspectives that a, a person who wants to do this kind of work or command these kind of people? Yeah, let's talk about the command element of it. How do we how do we do this? How do you get your people prepared? How do you let them do their job? Because I'll tell you right now, the way I do it is not going to be the way you do it. And, you know, you have to be comfortable with that as a commander. Yeah, that, that's a good point, and, and, and I'm afraid we're going to stray here, but this should be put in the manual. Um, and, and this is based on, and there, there are unclassified after-action reports that have, that have brought this out. Uh, this is a concrete real-world example, albeit a few years back. Uh, with the insurgency in Colombia, um, uh, you know, with with the Escobar drug cartel, as I said, we're going back a few years. Uh, scroll forward, Mexico, same thing. Um, the the ability uh, of the United States, with a little bit, a little bit of effort, of being able to round up Spanish speakers, um, 
particularly at the at the uh, uh, troop operational level, uh, is a, is a fairly easy job. I, I mean, we have I can't quote the census, but what's the population of native Spanish speakers in this country today? It's pretty high. But going back to sensitivities, Pete, uh, what I saw in Colombia, I saw it in Peru, uh, and, and these are real world operations. These aren't conceptualized or anything, stuff I was involved in. Um, at the national level or at the DOD minimum at Department of Army or Headquarters Marine Corps or whatever level the decision is made, the thinking was locking because, oh, look at Jose Gutierrez. He speaks Spanish. Well, Jose's from, Jose's from Puerto Rico. Jose hangs out with a lot of Puerto Ricans, and Jose's a good soldier, and et cetera, et cetera. Well, it's, you know, we'll send five or seven Jose's down to train Colombian uh, counterinsurgency forces. Not good. Not good. Uh, there, there, there are societal, I hate to use it, racial, uh, within Latin America that people should be aware of. Puerto Ricans were not and are not as well accepted as if you'd have gotten an Ecuadorian or ideally a bunch of Colombians. And when I was a battalion commander, believe it or not, I had five Colombian kids. Uh, you know, huh. none of them were officers, but these guys were great. I mean, born in Colombia, but that was at a different time where their service would lead to their citizenship. Uh, I would not. I, I don't think even then, if somebody said, I need five men, we got to send them to Puerto Rico. I said, OK, I got five Colombians who speak Spanish. Don't send them. Right. They're, would they not be able to do the job? No, not necessarily. But there would be a friction there that would not contribute to maximum efficiency in accomplishing the mission. And also, look, I've uh, I've seen, and gosh, you know, look, Sergeant Major, whoever it's going to be, this case it's a Sergeant Major. I've seen the Sergeant Major say, we need to have our female engagement team go out. We don't have anybody. And the sergeant major says, well, Miller's a female. She can do it. Technically, yes, she's a female. She can yeah. do it. Yeah. But can yeah. she accomplish anything? You know, the training aspect of this is is absolutely critical to be even if you are Puerto Rican and you go to the to the Colombians and they hate Puerto Ricans, for example. It, it is a barrier that you know about, and if you've been trained, you know how to work around that barrier or even make a joke of it and say, hey, they sent the Puerto Rican to Tata the Colombian, and then boom, all the walls come down. And within a few words, you know, fast friends, if you've been trained on the, you know, how to deal with these things. Yeah. Uh, actually, I, I, uh, I, I feel, I feel uh, stunted uh, in the sense that by the time I left the service, uh, uh, integration of, of, uh, of uh, uh, females into into standardized units uh, was was really just getting underway. Uh, I, I think I missed a tremendous opportunity to observe a revolutionary thing that is in the best interest of the, of the services. And like you, Pete, I, I, I was never overseas where uh, women were u- utilized. In fact. My last command as a JTF commander was the only command I had that had a lot of women in it. That happened to be at Guantanamo. It was fortuitous that I had a lot of the best Spanish speakers were females. And I'm not, I'm not going to say what service, because they were in all services. My adjutant was, a, a was <laughs> believe it or not, female Puerto Rican uh, captain. Uh, I thought they they brought a lot to the table that the male did not, and I can only imagine in an environment that you've been matured in, exposed to, and understand that they could be a tremendous asset or they could be a very bad liability. 
Well, yeah, and when it's been a liability, it's not been because they were a female. Right. It's because right. the the institution has let them down and not prepared them properly for the job. It, you know, they've been sent out to do something, and this is that whole conversation of affect is always better than effect, effect especially yeah. in this line of work. Right. People spit the bit on affect being a noun, but the reality is it can be used as a noun. And when you when you seek you know, the definition for affect as a noun is basically you're looking for a response to stimuli, an emotional response. And if I can create trust, you can go have a hundred meetings, I will win. That's correct. Because I've taken the time. Six months, a year, however long it takes. It doesn't take a year. And it doesn't take six months. But if, if I build that trust, I will get a lot more done and I will get to the, especially as a, as a collector, I will get to the the third level friends that are the ones that I need to talk right. to and again, build trust with. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and um, well, I'm not going to wonder or feel, but this, this business of, and, and let's be frank, um, Pete, we as a nation, we as a nation, are an impatient people, and <laughs> <laughs> we we the idea of spending even six weeks, much less six or nine months, in building rapport right. so you can become very effective, sort of goes against our grain as a nation. Yeah, yeah, and and that so so this brings up a good point. One of those critical tasks that or skills that you need to build is is developing some calluses over our tender spots and our impatience is certainly one of those areas where, you know, the more here's what I've learned: the more I injected myself and my ego into my partnership relationships, the worse I performed. The less me that was there, the more I could tease them out. And a lot of times we're so dominant. We're the military. We have all the power. We have all the money. We have all the ideas. The more we do that, we just run over the top of our partner, just run them flat and smooth. And every partner teaches them that. And so I would watch these guys physically lean back and shield themselves against the part against the American partner because they were just being inundated with ideas and thoughts and words. And there was just absolutely no room for them to act. So... They were taught to, to not act. That's how they were part. That's how they were advised, basically, uh, uh, through our actions. And, and I'll be so bold to say that uh, you and I can extrapolate mm-hmm. into those U.S. civilian agencies that do this type of thing, and you run into the same thing. It has nothing to do with wearing a uniform. It has to do with a, right. a national ethos and the training that they've been suge- subjected to. And, and uh, you know, I, I would say that saying, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a sergeant major, uh, I've got uh, 27 years service, and uh, you damn well better listen to me. That attitude uh, can be just as easily found in some of the other letter agencies that translate is, I'm from DEA, uh, I'm FBI, but I would, I would, I would jack it up one level. I'm American. I know more than you do. And, and right. that's, that's sad. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. And it's an easy trap to fall into. And I'm Absolutely. positive we have both found ourselves in it. And I, I get pissed at myself. I'm like, what am I doing? I, I know better, you know? Yeah, yeah you're, you're, you're absolutely right. And, uh, but again, I would offer that consideration should be given of addressing that that attitude within the manual that we're envisioning here. Yeah, yeah. So the ability to to withstand your own discomfort Absolutely. and and I like to call it miscomfort because the, uh, the the prefix is better because this is just an unknown or an unfamiliar comfort. You can get comfortable with working at a pace that works for their culture instead of jarring them out of their culture and creating a new one for them or forcing right. them down your cultural right. path. Let's find out how we can, it's easier for us to move to theirs and then because they want to learn but don't make them learn a new cultural way to approach things a new system of learning you know all these things figure out what's there and slowly improve upon that path that they're on already yeah yeah i again I, but we've talked before and there's there's i think a tremendous confluence in our thinking and our thoughts on this on this matter the um, 
the whole business of, of being able to go in and liaison or lays is predicated in all the things we've just talked about. Uh, I would also, we've talked around it. In fact, we just finished talking around it. Uh, I don't know how you teach or train, but I think you should put it in writing is the element of patience. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and easier said than done. Oh, but, absolutely. But, and, and I guess... This is this brings up the point in general, this kind of work is fraught with mistakes and you slowly as you get better at it, you're just simply avoiding mistakes and taking the, yeah. you know the, the, the path that's proven to be less problematic than the way that we've tried before. And again, inserting your ego, inserting your commander. That's nice way to say it. Okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> Moving right along. But that's but that's exactly uh, that's exactly where we need to be. Like if you're not constantly making mistakes, then you are making the first mistake. You are making you. That is the first mistake right there. Is you have to constantly recognize that you don't know enough. You're absolutely. not asking the right questions. Absolutely. There's background you could get into. Uh, uh, that's absolutely true. And, and I think something that you've brought up before, Pete, and I, I heavily, heavily second it. And I would ask that uh, somewhere somebody in the manual put in one of the ultimate unspoken truths. Uh, unless you go completely native, get out and live, and we've known people have done that in the Philippines and yeah. etc. Unless you're going to do that, and that's, that's a very, very, very thin slice of our population. Unless you do that, I would say in the menu you got to put someplace in there, regardless of how much time you spend with these people, regardless unless you, regardless of how close you've gotten, remember, you're in their country, not in ours, and ultimately, right. you're going to leave, and they're going to stay. <laughs> yes, that's right. And and when you were, one of my favorite questions, as I, we were starting to wind down, because I was in a lot of places where we wound down, was, no fooling, we're leaving. There's not much time to do anything else. Has anyone talked to you about this? And what do you absolutely need that's here right now? And the eyes, their eyes would be gigantic. Yeah, they're like, no, you're 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 kidding. You're not really leaving. Like, I am telling you right now, because literally, literally, like, how bad of a partner are we when we don't inform our partner that we're leaving with all of our stuff and giving them an idea, a transition plan? There's a whole paper we wrote called Transition Operations. As we transition out. What do you have to do? And it's it's a it's akin to, you know, you can, you know, clear, hold, build. Then, then what? Like you have to transition away from that. But these kind of lessons, as as a partner, you know, winding down your relationship, creating not just a good handoff, but a perfect handoff. You yeah. know, like really spending your time. Talk about that. I. I I don't have any personal experience of that. Uh, so whatever I say is, is what I've read, what I've theorized, or what I've thought about. Uh, I certainly cannot say I've practiced this like you have. I think our recent history is replete, of, replete with examples of what we don't want to do. Uh, we don't have to name any wars or anything. I, uh, we got an intelligent audience; they can think think about it themselves. And even more recently, where we've essentially put somebody or a group of people out on the limb, uh, if not unintentionally halfway sawed through the limb. You're you're absolutely right, and 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 I would say even though we sort of sort of. Uh, left Central America, we, the United States, uh, with a misplaced sense of hauteur uh, in that we had won, unquote. The consequences, and this is, I am familiar with, uh, particularly from being with DEA, the consequences of failing to look at a good exit strategy. I don't care if you're doing it with tail between your legs or you're 
walking down the Champs-Élysées with a crown of laurels. You better have a transition plan. You better have, okay, Mr. Nyunk, we're going to be leaving here in three to six months. That is not my decision, but we have to work together and how best we can do that. That was not done in Central America, and, 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 and I've written reports on that, the consequences of that. I would argue, Pete, I would argue that because of that, of a certain national hauteur, as the French would say, we left El Salvador, we left Nicaragua, I'm not Nicaragua, El Salvador, Honduras, less so uh, Costa Rica, um, Guatemala. Uh, we left there, and now we're paying the price and the consequences of leaving the way we left. And I have argued in a couple of papers for a federal agency to the effect that what we're dealing with now is the flotsam and jetsam that we left in the mid to eight, late 80s in Central America. And here it is, 2010. That's when I wrote one of the papers. It's 2010. And look at what the hell we're dealing with. Yeah. Planning. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the old, uh, uh, a little bit of out of line, a little bit below here, the old, the, the seven Ps, you know, uh, proper mm -hmm. planning, proper prior planning prevents piss poor performance. Uh, we mouth that a lot. Uh, I'm not too sure how much we practice. Yeah, yeah, a lot to be said there for that because this is, uh, you know, this is actually the thing. This is that that departure, that transition to something else, often includes very simple things that that person needs, and they will shock you with their candor. And I promise you can take it. I, I, prom <laughs> I promise you can take it when they look at you and say. How long would your government function without electricity? You have to now, if you care, and as a good, in, you know, as a good partner, you, you should care. Uh, as you look at that, you have to say, you're right. How do we get this person a generator? Something that we're likely to leave behind, you know, and yes, it's a paperwork fiasco. But if we're really trying to create, not leave a bunch of debris field in our path right. as we leave, right. but getting that obsolete generator that no one wants, does, isn't worth the money, it's going to get and put into a scrapyard and sold somewhere in Germany, why not just write that thing off as lost or stolen? Or And I'm not saying commit crimes. What I'm saying is do the work and understand, like, at a minimum, what do you need? Electricity. I can get by if I have that. And and they'll have the, they'll know those things. You just have to ask them, what is it right. that you need? Right. Yeah. Uh, at, and I, I'm sure you, with your example... Um, you know, the electricity was was premium because of the guerrillas' tactics of blowing up pylons but uh, in El Salvador. But I, I'm sure it was critically, much more critical uh, in the part of the world that you were exposed to it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. To be able to to take that type of thinking and, and, and saying, uh, you know, uh, you know the right people, uh, and you don't have to be in a combat zone. You can write off right. gear as excess gear. Uh, and yeah. and uh, what's the damage going to be done vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, you know, sell him an extreme discount to a junkyard in, in Frankfurt, Germany, or right. writing him off as inoperable or not serviceable and giving him to a people that they rely on yeah. for survival? What, I, I, I'm not too sure there's a there's any choice there. Yeah, yeah. And, and if, if if you're worried about, well, what if they sell the electricity, or what if they, what if they, there's not enough of anything there. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yes, they're going to use it to their advantage to try to provide as much help and to as many people as possible, and there might be a cost for that. But this in this particular case, this valley had no electricity yeah. in it. And, and in Iraq, the, these guys were out in the hinterlands of the Baghdad district. They had no power at all. And they were going to have reliable power. You give them reliable power, now they can try to be, but give them all this high speed laptop training and all, but no, no ability to have reliable electricity. 
and it's an old Chevy 350 generator, you know, motor. Yeah. It's it's not we're not talking million dollar things here. Those kind of solutions. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, we we I I when I was doing car drugs in Peru, um, um, the um, At Atiata tribe, uh, one of the Peruvian or Amazon tribes that was fairly prominent in the area I was operating at the time was, um, and and you know by by American standards, by Western, I don't want to, I don't want to smirch the United States by Western standards. Uh, these people were primitive, extremely clever, and uh, talking to the Peruvians, uh, one of which I think really understood them, the others were uh, not surprising, uh, racist, superior, whatever. And, you know, he said, these are the things we need to get to them. And they were basic things like like medicine. I'm not, I'm not talking penicillin. I'm not talking IVs. I'm not, I'm not even going up that level. I'm talking about uh, God forbid nobody's know what the hell it is. Uh, methylate and curacrome. Huh? What's that? <laughs> Those are medicines that survive in the jungle, don't need refrigeration, yeah. and they're very easy to teach on how to put them on. Um, you know, uh, and and his, this is my proving colleague, his comment was, do we send him to the Harvard Business School because he's going to make his tribe better, or do we give him things with which he can make his tribe better? Right. I mean, yes. it sounds like a philosophical. It's not. It's not even rhetorical. It's basic. Yeah. Uh, we're running out of time here. Two real quick questions for you. One, um, we have a tendency in the military to, and we've talked about this, so you'll you'll know uh, where we're going with this. But we have a tendency to overvalue physical fitness in terms of the ability to do these jobs, because as you know, these are delicate, deliberate jobs, packed with failure, right? And the ability to do push-ups or run three miles or flip over a tire, I would say, are you know, tertiary, m- m- maybe the fourth level of things. But what is, what is your sense of it? Like the, the I'm not saying don't meet don't meet a minimum standard. Obviously, someone who's physically fit. But where does that that drive that physical fitness? Where does that fit in terms of selection for someone to do these tasks? Well, again, I'll give you uh, not a concrete example because I I like to think I had a little bit of influence on this. We did have some SF people. Uh, in uh, Tel Aviv. Uh, they didn't go out in the field, but there were a couple of SF, part of the uh, mill group, uh, as far as training uh, the Palestinians. Uh, and my comment was both these guys were good, and, and, and they were they were good, they were all right with the Palestinians, uh, but they were SF. Uh, one was a sergeant, the senior one was sergeant first class army, and I, I, without using his name, I would say, jokingly, I said, uh, you know, how many push-ups and how many pull-ups and how fast can you do your run? Does that make you a better trainer of the Palestinians? Well, of course, his answer is, of course it does. And my retort to him is, so if Charles Atlas shows up here, we're going to have top-notch security for us, right? <laughs> that, that, was, that, was my, that was my retort, Pete. Uh, uh, yeah, it... it, it we're in the military. There's a need for it to encrown it as our supreme goal. Needs serious rethinking. And I would say also to the um, if you're going to be an alpha, and and I think guys like us are alphas. You can't be the alpha in that room. You have to be. You have to be someone else. And so no, no, if no. you're, no, you know. No, no. <laughs> That's why I use the Charles Charles Atlas <laughs> an- analogy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, some 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 puny kids are going to come along and throw sand in his eyes. Uh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, it goes back to what we were talking about early. Uh, we draw a certain type of individual, be it man or woman, uh, into this into this uh, milieu that we're talking about. This uh, idea of liaison and, and, and assistant in training, but shoulder to shoulder with foreign counterparts. Um, you draw a certain type of individual uh, that, that uh, 
by and large, you, you, you want to have. Uh, I think it has to go into the manual along with the fact that you can do 50 pull-ups does not make you de facto qualified for this job. Also, what needs to go in there, Pete, is, uh, you know, you're an alpha, alpha male. Uh, you were high school football captain. You this, that, did the shot, but blah, rah, rah. That does not necessarily make you qualified. In fact, we may have to deprogram you because you really do have some good qualities. And that deprogramming consists of you're not the best guy in the room. You are there in a very humble position. And I think a good lead in, going back to our initial part of the conversation, good lead in with foreign counterparts is I'm here to learn from you. Yeah. A humble position is a, a great note. And not too many alpha, alpha males yeah. do that. And, and they certainly can. This isn't that denigrate physical fitness. They can. Right. Absolutely. But you have to understand that you can never be the smartest person in the room. You can, you know, it, you have to yeah. always accept that you probably culturally, at least the dumbest person in the room with, with all of your partners. So, you know. Oh, <laughs> I, I could, I could, absolutely make a plausible argument for that. I'll jump and say I could probably make a compelling argument yes. for that. If you could have these uh, SFAB folks read one book, and obviously there are many they should read, but what's your one book? Okay, that that um, believe it or not, now, I'm not going to recommend it because it, it has not been translated. It's a, uh, um, it's a Spanish translation of a liaison working with foreign powers that the French army put together during the Algerian War. And it's not what you think uh, or what you might think that it is. Uh, uh, it does not go into torture. It doesn't do anything else. It's talking about, and this is a very odd mix, it's talking about French army enlisted personnel being able to work with, conjunction with, extract information, intelligence, uh, for what was called the Pied Noir. And that was Algerian-born mm -hmm. French people. Now, they were torn. Um, some of them had married Algerian women, uh, they fought both sides. But I, I thought it was, a, I think it is, uh, a provocative book because if you can think about the complexity of going into someplace like Algeria, where you've been for what, 130 right. years, uh, you've got Frenchmen that were born there, their children were born there, their loyalties are there, uh, you, you've You've given them the sense that really Algeria has become another province of France, which, of course, it can't be because <laughs> the population dominance is Algerian and they want their own country. But think about go, sending a liaison officer into that environment, not to work with the French, for, French forces against the Algerian insurgency, but to operate with a segment of that Algerian population that might be ambivalent, might be very supportive, or might be counter to what the French government is trying to do. That's that's kind of a kind of an iffy situation. How successful were they? Right. I don't know. I don't know. But uh, uh, the Best English translators. I'm looking forward to my bookshelf here. I'll give you a, a house. It was published in uh, was published in Madrid, the Spanish version, but it's it's never been translated into Spanish, uh, and and with the data on it, uh, w along with the original French title. But uh, that that is certainly one of them. Uh, uh, the other one, and I think that this is is. Uh, Again, I'm, I'm, I'm dating myself. There's probably s several that are so much better. This is, this is a uh, book that 
I think given the situation in the Middle East, again, it's, it's somewhat dated. The title of it is Sacred Rage, written by Robin Wright. Uh, Robin is a woman, and now is in the UK, but she was born and raised in Lebanon. That again, uh, particularly in this book, and I, I mention it because as you and I both know, the demographic makeup of Lebanon is absolutely fascinating, not only from an ethnic point yeah. of view, but from a religious point of view. The Druze, the Christians, the Muslims. And then you want to throw in that little confounding fact, Sunnah and Shia. And and, and I, I offer the books because will they will they make them better liaison officers? Uh, advisors, whatever you want to do. Uh, not necessarily, but I would say uh, both of them were sensitizing to the vast complexity of the world they're going to go into. Well, that is a good lay down of partnering and getting into the liaising thing. And, and just with those two books, a heck, one requires you to go ahead and get some language capacity if you don't have it already. But thanks a lot, for John, for, for doing this with me. It's always a pleasure to have you on the show. And it's always great just to discuss these things because it, this isn't about anyone's intention or anyone's effort. We all make these mistakes. It's the institution is trying to improve and it's not easy to, to build these things kind of on the fly. So that's why we're putting these lessons down so that someone who's at this symposium or the next one or the next one or the next one has a chance to build on the lessons that they have because these are it's the subtle things I think that make the difference the uh, the patients being humble building trust if you focused on those three things you'd already be ahead of 95 percent of the field yeah, absolutely and uh, well I could go on, but thank you very much for having me. I appreciate your time. I appreciate your guidance. And in nautical terms, I much appreciate the rudder instructions. Thank you. <laughs>